Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we are going to have a look to the series that the fantastic channel Oversimplified recently uploaded about the second Punic War after we've reviewed a couple days before the first Punic War. So let's review the second round between the two Mediterranean superpowers. Let's go. All right, our beloved mercenaries, let's hear it. <laughs> okay. Thank you one and all for your hard work fighting in the first Punic War. Would have been nice if you'd won, maybe tried a little harder, but this isn't the finger pointing convention. I know you all have one thing on your minds. Hey, when are we all getting paid? <laughs> Remember you lost your... Okay. Jim, why don't you tell them? I'm not telling them, you tell them. Ugh. Look, you're not getting paid. What? We lost the first Punic War and owe the Romans a ton of reparations. Of course we can't pay you in full. Let's burn this place to the ground! Hey, hey! Don't burn this place to the ground. Come on, fellas. Will killing us really make you feel better about your money? Yes. Way to go, sir. Shut up, Jim. You're f and I think that this man is supposed to be a man called Hanno. He's actually one of the main important people in the Carthaginian Senate. And he's a wealthy landowner and uh, aristocrat. He will play a very important role role later when he lead a faction. You're fired! I guess that makes two of us. Huh? In the aftermath of the First Punic War, Carthage's disgruntled mercenaries, left unpaid for all their hard work, revolted, and Carthage found itself caught up in an extremely destructive mercenary war. And the mercenary war, to understand it, let's go back to what ended actually the First Punic War. So the First Punic War ended due not to a decisive crippling defeat, but to the lack of will between the members of the Carthaginian oligarchy. So Carthage is an oligarchy, meaning that they are ruled by a, a very small number of individuals and these are wealthy landowners. And this small group wanted to put an end to uh, the first Punic War because it was extremely costly. And so you have this war which left the coffins of the state empty. Let's remember that they've lost something like 500 boats and 500 boats is an enormous cost. On top of that, you have the fact that the Roman invasion of the territories around Carthage caused exodus and famine. So you have a lot of civil unrest. And as a consequence, you have all these mercenaries who are going to come back who are going to wage a war, but not for uh, a politic victory. No, they are only going to, to wage war in the purpose of looting villages, countrysides to repay themselves. And thus, as it's a civil war, they won't oblige to any kind of customs that people at the time were, were respecting during the conduct of war. So it's going to be horrible. The panicked Carthaginians hired more mercenaries to fight the mercenaries they couldn't afford to pay, and Carthage came dangerously close to collapse. All the while, across the water, there was Rome. Ha! Look at those morons! We just kicked their ass in the First Punic War, and now their own mercenaries are revolting! Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah. Wait, First Punic War? You mean there's gonna be a second one? Well, we're definitely taking advantage of this situation. So almost certainly, yes. The Romans did, in fact, take advantage of the situation. Amongst the chaos, rebels on the Carthaginian island of Sardinia sent out a cry for help to Rome. Hot diggity dog, said the Romans. That's free real estate. And so in, they went. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's our island. Get the hell off. Hey, they requested our help. We're simply helping. Oh, no, you don't. Look, we're sending our own army to deal with the rebels, okay? 
just to be clear, we're not trying to start a fight with you, so, you know, don't declare war on us or anything. War! <laughs> we surrender! Great! So the Roman Senate voted in favor of the war, so Rome is very much ready to wage war again against Carthage. And the problem is that Carthage has no longer any kind of sea power. They have no fleet left, so there's nothing they can do. So Rome sensed weakness and doubled down with these two annexions and additional compensation. And as part of the peace treaty, we get to keep these islands. No! The Carthaginians were hopping mad. As if their humiliating loss in the First Punic War wasn't bad enough, the Romans now took advantage of their mercenary problem and stole their islands. This shocking land grab was pretty hard to justify, even by Roman standards. Additionally, the Romans now demanded Carthage pay them even more money on top of what was already owed. If Rome was trying to make Carthage as mad as possible, they were doing a fantastic job. The seeds of a second Punic War were being sown, and they were being watered with Carthaginian tears. Resentment in Carthage only continued to grow. Eventually, Carthage solved their mercenary problem thanks to Carthaginian military genius and hero of the First Punic War, Hamilcar Barca. He sorted those naughty mercenaries out with some good old-fashioned atrocities, and the destructive mercenary war was over. Let's remember that Hamilcar is the guy who waged a very, very successful guerrilla war in Sicily. He wasn't defeated yet, he was the one who had to receive uh, the humiliating peace treaty imposed by the Romans, so he felt very much the humiliation even though he wasn't defeated. So Amilcar decapitated the rebellion by luring the rebel generals to negotiate a treaty, taking advantage of the situation to capture these rebels and put them to death. Meanwhile, his army was crushing the leaderless mercenaries, and he even managed to strengthen the Carthaginian territory in Africa and subdue the population there. So after that, his prestige is immense, and he had very, very strong supporters. Still, all was not well in Carthage. Mere decades ago, they were the top dogs in the Western Mediterranean. Now, after the crushing defeat in the First Punic War, and a huge bill to pay the Romans, Carthage was well and truly under Rome's thumb. <laughs> what on earth were they supposed to do? If they wanted any chance at regaining their former strength, there was one thing they needed now more than anything, money. But as long as they owed Rome a bazillion dollars, there was nothing they could do. Fortunately for them, amongst their ranks, there was one big hunk of a man with one big clump of a brain. Me! Hamilcar Barca! Yes! Wait, why do you all have the exact same voice? Ah, I have it too! That's right! Hero of the First Punic War, greatest general alive, and the poster above my bed, Hamilcar Barca had an idea. All right, we need money? Well, I've got one word for you. Spain. An area filled with lucrative silver mines, from which the silver would flow like a river. And our pockets would be stuffed, like Tony's mother at a buffet. Hey! So here's my proposal. What the hell? You send me with an army to Spain. I'll expand our territory, get those silver mines up and running, and we'll be able to pay the Romans back in no time. Okay. But just to check, you're not secretly raising the money to go on a bloodthirsty revenge spree against Rome, are you? Because we can't afford that. Hanno, my dear, I'm simply going to pay them back. He just spoke to someone he called Hanno, and Hanno, we talked about him a little bit earlier. So here you have two factions, the Barcids, who are supporting Hannibal Barca, who want to lead an expansion policy to revive the economic power of Carthage with new conquests, with Amilcar Barca at its head. And in this faction, um, you, you find mostly Mercan family. On the other faction, you have land-owning aristocrats who wanted to expand and strengthen their power in Africa and establish normal relations with Rome. And they are behind Hanno. 
Well, that wasn't reassuring. Few in Carthage were as bitter about their loss in the First Punic War as Hamilcar Barca. 98% of his brain matter had been reallocated to thoughts of revenge. He was also fed up with the Carthaginian politicians for what he deemed a cowardly betrayal when they surrendered at the end of the last war. And so for Hamilcar, going to Spain meant being able to act independently from the weak Carthaginian government, building his own strength, and then perhaps somewhere down the line, revenge. However, he wasn't going to Spain by himself. Hannibal? Yes, father? Would you like to come with me to build an empire in Spain? Oh boy, would I! Barbara, mind if I take our nine-year-old son with me? I want to implant an intense hatred of Rome in him and prepare him for a glorious campaign of vengeance. <sighs> Just try not to traumatize him, dear. No promises. The young boy Hannibal would accompany his father. Watching, learning. Boy, you see that city over there? Yes, father? That is Rome. Do you know what we do to Romans? No, father. We hate them, Hannibal. We hate them with every fiber of our being. But why, father? Can't I just play with my Digimons? No, son! They took everything from us. Our land, our wealth, our pride. Those animals. I'll tear them limb from limb. I'll burn their pathetic city to the ground. Dad? <laughs> I'm sorry, son. I've, I've just never been so proud. Keep going. I'll slaughter their people. <laughs> I'll cut off their faces and wear them as masks. <laughs> I love you, son. After taking him. And uh, the insane level of hatred that we attribute to Hannibal, maybe it's an exaggeration because we only have sources from Roman authors and they will very much put the emphasis of Hannibal has the ultimate villain who is only seeking for Rome's destruction. Hannibal to the Temple of Baal and having him swear an oath never to be a friend of Rome, off dad and son went for their lovely beach holiday in Spain. But Spain was already inhabited by many tribes people. And I think that we should more talk about Iberia because for century Carthage had very important trading posts in this region and it was by them becoming the main center for boosting Carthaginian finances. And it's important to say that Hamilcar left without the support of the Senate using its own mercenaries with the aim of enriching himself and creating an empire for himself. And when Hamilcar suddenly showed up in their territory, they were like, Hey, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? I'm teaching my son how to become a warrior like me. Aw, well that's sweet. Well then, little guy, let's see what you got. Good boy. As Hamilcar- And in fact, we know very little about Hannibal education. What we know is he had a Spartan tutor which kind of sets the tone for the nature of his education. Uh, he will be taught Greek literature, the history of Alexander the Great and the art of war. And we know that he was intelligent and especially cunning. Car got to work fighting the tribes of Iberia and expanding Carthaginian influence. Hannibal became a child of war, even earning battle scars from a young age. And he grew to become a great military leader himself, making his father very proud. I love you so much, son. Dad, not in front of the enemy. <laughs> you killed that guy so well, son. The Barcas successfully consolidated Carthaginian power, got those silver mines up and running, and were sending buckets of cash back to a money-starved Carthage. And symbolizing Carthage's regrowing strength, a beautiful new city would eventually be founded in Spain. New Carthage, with a magnificent palace at its center. Carthage is back, baby! What in the name of Apollo is going on here? Romans! Flowing silver mines? Dancing elephants? What are you up to, Hamilcar? I'm simply gathering the money to pay you back. Oh. Well, okay then. Or are you rebuilding strength to go on a bloodthirsty revenge spree? Like I said, Claudius, I'm simply trying to pay you back. Aw. You guys are hugging. <laughs> no, we're not! I was. <laughs> 
Hamilcar is founding like an empire there and actually it's known as the Barcid Empire, Hannibal, Barca, Barcid Empire. This new city will be his capital. It's a prime location because he's trying to recreate an arsenal for the Punic war fleet and it has very, very strong walls. So it's a perfect base of operation to rebuild their strength. I was hugging. <laughs> Hamilcar had practically carved out a kingdom for himself in Spain, free from the meddling Carthaginian politicians. His power was becoming immense. The Carthaginian recovery had been staggeringly quick, and Rome was seriously alarmed. But they were also preoccupied with ongoing wars elsewhere, including an expansionist war to the north, where they were enslaving thousands of northern Celts. Yeah, and it's very, very interesting and important that they mention it because a bit of geopolitical context, because after all, uh, Rome and Carthage aren't the only countries in the world. They are major threats to the north for Rome with Gallic invasions that have been extremely dangerous for Rome in the past. A century and a half ago, there was even a Gallic army under the command of a leader named Brennus that sacked and ransacked Rome. And to the east, you still have the Greek influence. So Rome is also surrounded by enemies, or at least hostile powers. So for now, to keep Carthage in check, the Romans insisted on a new treaty. See this river. The two sides agreed that everything above it was in Rome's sphere of influence, while beneath it was Carthage. Under no circumstances were the Carthaginians to expand north of that river. But for now, Hamilcar and son were living it up. Well, son, here's to many more years of successful campaigning in Spain. Now, if you'll excuse me, I just have to go fight those guys. See you later, son. I love you. What the? Oh crap, I drowned? Oh well, always remember son, you are vengeance. Also delete my browsing history. Hamilcar Barca was tragically ambushed at a river and drowned. His son-in-law, and possibly also his lover, no further questions, took charge for a while. But he too was later assassinated, leaving finally a 26-year-old Hannibal in charge of the Carthaginian armies in Spain. Sources say the men readily accepted him as their leader. He chose to suffer the same hardships as his men. He lived in the same conditions, was often the first into battle and the last one out. And it also helped that he looked a lot like his dad. He had the total respect of his men. If he said jump, they said how high. If he said tuck me in, they said how tight. If he said talk to a girl without peeing your pants, they said that's impossible. That's impossible. So until then, Hannibal had been a soldier like any other. He had taken command of the cavalry under Hasdrubal. The army appointed him to succeed Hasdrubal. In a way, he was kind of, if you will, the people's hero against the old Carthaginian nobles with still Anno at their head. And to motivate your army, you need uh, to bond them against a common enemy. And Hannibal had no shortage of energy to turn his men against Rome. Nobody can do that. An army that would follow him anywhere would be crucial for exacting his vengeance against Rome. Hannibal's army had become a strong and loyal fighting force and that was making a certain nation very uncomfortable. Seeing Carthage re-strengthen so quickly was not something Rome had expected, yet here they were, paying off their debts and expanding their territory. It didn't feel very much like Carthage was under Rome's thumb at all, and Rome wanted to put an end to it. Tensions were strung tighter than your liar's g-string, and all it would take was one incident to trigger all-out war. And in 219 BC, a city in Spain would find itself at the very center of that fateful incident, Saguntum. Remember that treaty declaring everything south of this river to be Carthage's sphere of influence? Well, Saguntum should therefore obviously be Carthaginian, right? Wrong! 
Saguntum had actually scored itself an informal alliance with Rome, after Rome had helped it with an internal dispute. With Carthaginian encroachment, Saguntum began to fear for its independence, and Rome declared itself Saguntum's protector. But this clearly went against the Ebro River Treaty. So what on earth was Rome doing? Were the Sugantines and the Romans truly just BFFs? <laughs> it's possible. Or was Rome deliberately trying to interfere with Hannibal's Spanish expansion and maintain a staging post for a future war with Carthage? More likely. There are many versions to this story, but one that seems possible is that first, Hannibal kind of agitated the people around Saguntum against the city. The city felt threatened and called on Rome. Rome arrived in cowboy mold and told Hannibal to keep quiet. And you don't say that to Hannibal. Uh, and at this point, everybody was preparing for war for years. So a string of provocations is all that you need. And Hannibal certainly viewed this Rome Saguntum alliance as an outrage. Yet another example of Roman arrogance. At first, he left Saguntum alone. But having learnt from his father to hate all things Roman and having inherited his father's dream of bringing Rome to its knees more and more, Hannibal may have begun to see Saguntum as an opportunity. Could this controversial alliance be just what devilish little Hannibal needed to kickstart a second war with Rome and restore Carthaginian dominance? It's even possible that Rome we're also using Saguntum to goad Hannibal into a fight, so they could go and kick him out of Spain. And as the two giants began gearing up for round two, the poor people of Saguntum had no idea that they were about to be crushed in the collision. Hey, your alliance with Saguntum is an insult, and we won't stand for it. They're our friends, Hannibal, and if you lay a finger on them, it'll be an act of war. Yeah, Hannibal, back the hell off. War, eh? I was thinking I might just besiege their city and massacre their people. I hope you do, Hannibal. Find out what happens. Yeah, we hope you do, Hannibal. Wait, what? Maybe I will. Go ahead, kill them all. Uh, okay then. Fine, fine. Okay, guess I'll do just that. Consul? We look forward to it. Consul? You're gonna protect us though, right, Consul? Consul! Oh no! To top it all off, when the Saguntine people made the genius decision of raiding into Carthaginian territory, enough was enough. In an action that was guaranteed to provoke the Romans into war, Hannibal besieged the city. The siege of Saguntum lasted eight cruel months before Hannibal broke through the city defenses and turned Saguntum into a killing field. It was a massacre. Yeah, because the longer a siege lasts, the harsher the reprisals against the population will be. Actually, I read the story and the story is very, very much hardcore. So first, Hamilcar offers the city to surrender, but with extremely harsh conditions. The people in Saguntum have to give up all the silver and the gold in the city. The inhabitants have to leave Saguntum with just one item of clothing, that means also without any kind of weapon, and go to a place indicated by the Carthaginians. The rest, frankly, I don't know whether it's true or not. Probably it's over-exaggerating, but it's frankly a horror movie. So you have the inhabitants of Sagondum who decide to collect all the gold and silver in the city and melt it down together so uh, Hamilcar can put his hand on it. So they burn everything and then some of the Saguntine's nobles throw themselves into the fire and they start to engage in a collective suicide as the Iberians consider that uh, no uh, man can live without its weapon. Actually, if you live without 
your weapon, it's like you're already half dead. At the same time, the whole crowd is gathering and you have all these nobles killing themselves, uh, which must already be a, a frightening sight. One of the city's tower is seized by Hannibal's soldiers and they are all going to breach through the wall. So um, Hannibal's soldiers are going to fall down on the population and they are going to kill everybody that has not committed suicide yet and is going to be a bloodbath. What the hell? Tell me I didn't just catch you massacring our friends, the Sugantees. Well, Consul, if you like the Sugantees so much, perhaps you should suck on these nuts. <laughs> Hearing word of the attack on Saguntum, Rome was understandably in an uproar, and all eyes were now fixated on what would happen next as Rome sent a delegation to Carthage, led by one of the most highly esteemed Roman senators, Fabius Maximus. He demanded an answer for Hannibal's sins. All right, listen up, scum. You've got a rogue general in Spain attacking a Roman ally. What are we supposed to do about it? Well, there shouldn't have even been a Roman ally in Spain. You're the aggressor here. Hand Hannibal over to us as a criminal so we can punish him severely. No, yes, no, yes. no. Look, I hold in the folds of my toga both peace and war. Which one should I let drop? Whichever one you want, then I choose. The Second Punic War had begun. Pack it up, boys! We've got them! We already destroyed these clowns once, and we were the underdogs. Now, we're the overdogs? Hot dogs. Exactly. This is gonna be E Z. Here's the plan. Consul Longus, you take your army and sail straight for Carthage. Burn that city to the ground! And Consul Scipio, you just head on over to Iberia and make sure this Hannibal guy doesn't do anything crazy. I mean, what's he gonna do? Cross the Alps? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to what? Cross the Alps. We're going to what? I just told you, Hannibal will freeze to death. Trust me, Jerome. The Romans are expecting us to fight the same way we did last time. Passively, taking no initiative. They think it's gonna be E, Z. So this time, we have to be aggressive. We have to go on the attack. It sickens me to say this, but this time, we have to be a little more Roman. <gasps> yeah. This plan sounds crazy on paper because, well, he's about to take an army with elephants across not only the Alps, but also the Pyrenees. Uh, sorry for the spoiler, but it's the only way when you really think about it. As far as the Navy is concerned, they no longer have the power to fight in the Mediterranean. And economically and politically, they cannot afford to take the fight on Carthage soil. So they have to do something bold. You mean we're gonna take poops and baths together? But I'm insecure about my hairy legs! No! I'm saying this time, we're gonna take the fight to them. Think about it. Rome thinks they're simply going to invade us and win the war. So when they suddenly find themselves being invaded from the north, they'll freak out. Like Tony's mother, when the buffet runs out of shrimp. Hey! I gotta admit, it's actually kind of genius. And my hairy legs will insulate me from the cold! That's the spirit! Hannibal, you have my sword! And my spear. And my legs. Ugh. <laughs> Hannibal's plan, a daring alpine trek to surprise the Romans, was a bold but risky strategy. If it paid off, he could catch the Romans with their pants down, but he could also end up losing a ton of men and supplies in the hostile mountain conditions. Nevertheless, in 218 BC, with a fire in his eyes and some vengeance in his belly, Hannibal brought his force of almost 100,000 men across the Ebro River. They spent months on the road, trekking through the cold, hostile mountain conditions. And when they finally reached the other side, they said, Hooray! We did it! We crossed the Alps. No, those were the Pyrenees. Those are the Alps. 
And just by the time he managed to cross the Elba and the Pyrenees, he already lost one fourth of his army. After crossing the Pyrenees, the army then had to pass through southern Gaul, a vast territory filled with tribespeople, many of whom were hostile to Hannibal's presence. His journey to the Alps was an ordeal in itself, as he was forced to fight his way through and incurred pretty hefty losses before even reaching the mountains. His plan was almost stopped in its tracks entirely, as the Roman consul Scipio, on his way to Iberia, discovered Hannibal was right on his doorstep. Suddenly, Hannibal's journey became a race, as he rushed to get his massive army across the vast Rhone River before the Romans could intercept him. The crossing was chaotic, with the panicking elephants causing several men to drown. And the first combat of the war occurred when small scouting parties from each side encountered one another. When Scipio finally caught up to Hannibal's position, what he found was an empty Carthaginian camp. Hannibal had slipped through his fingers. The Roman consul Scipio felt the weight of the situation. Quite unbelievably, Hannibal was going to cross the Alps into Italy, and the Romans had no idea where he would emerge. For the first time, a Carthaginian force had the Roman homeland under threat. Scipio sent his men onto Iberia as planned, but he himself rushed home to raise a new army so that if Hannibal survived the crossing, Scipio would be there, waiting. Would you look at that, boys? We're here! The Alps! Although it is a little later than I expected. Yeah, it's kind of chilly. We'll set up camp here and wait for spring, right? It's way too cold, right? Hannibal? Hannibal's famous crossing of the Alps was brutal. Remember that uh, the greatest killer in war is not the battlefield, it's the campaign itself because when the people are moving to another region, their organism has to cope with a new, a new kind of food, new kind of bacteria, and new kind of environment which their body is not accustomed to. And here you have an extreme variation of the condition your body has to deal with. So it's going to be extremely brutal. It was already autumn and the men suffered terribly. It was cold. Men would fall off the sides of icy cliffs. They starved. They fell off the sides of icy cliffs. Some sources say they had to eat their pack animals and would finish off dying comrades in order to take their clothes for extra warmth. And then they would fall off the sides of icy cliffs. Imagine an army of 50,000 men with all of their horses, supplies, and 37 elephants trying to navigate the most hostile mountain range in Europe. And it wasn't just nature that they were up against. Tribes people lived in the mountains, and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. A tribe approached Hannibal and said, Hey man, geez, that's some nice armor. What is that, gold? Man, I'd really like that armor. Hey boss, they've got food as well. Shut up, be cool. Hey, why don't you let us guide you through this narrow gorge? We're not gonna kill you or nothing. Just walk right on through there. We're not gonna kill you. It's just right this way. We're not gonna kill you. Hannibal's army were- And even today, no historian knows where he went or how he found his route. But we can assume that, you know, there were no maps at the time, obviously. So he had to rely on local guides to show him the way. On top of that, what's impressive during the whole stuff is that he still had an army who was loyal to him. And this army was made up different ethnic groups and they had different languages. And so they must be wondering what the hell they are doing there. And potentially all he has to maintain the cohesion of this huge human group is his prestige were forced to fight their way through the gorge as massive boulders rained down on them from above. Some clever reorganization of his line helped them survive and they were able to fend off the opportunistic tribes. But losses from the constant attacks were heavy. As the journey continued, men who went over the sides would get stuck on the ice sheets below and had to make a grisly choice between starving to death or just getting it over with. 
When the deeply demoralized army reached the summit and rested for a couple days, Hannibal tried to lift their spirits with a rousing speech. Look, men, down there, it's Rome. These plains stretching out in front of you are bountiful with food to eat and Romans to kill. Move, Bessie! Oh, and with the elephant taking a dump, so there's something I discovered while preparing the episode. Scientists had an original ID, and that's why we love scientists so much. So they actually try to find elephant poop in the Alps, so to find out where Hannibal went through. And so I can't exactly remember how successful or unsuccessful the project was, but it seemed that they found a lot of tracks and this suggested that actually there was not one single route, but at least two. And the fact that they found these excrements all the way to Italy indicates that some Elephants made it through the Alps, actually. Look! You have just climbed the walls of Rome! The hard part is over. From here on out, it's all downhill, and nobody else will die. Except for them. The rest of us here, no one dies. Starting now. Okay. Let's go. Oh, for goodness sake! As it turned out, the descent was as deadly as the way up. With the cold really starting to set in, the path became even more narrow. And at one point, the men spent three days in the freezing cold, repairing a collapsed road. When they finally reached the bottom, Hannibal said, Look, guys, we did it! <sighs> well, I thought it went really well. When Hannibal left Spain, he had about 100,000 men. By the time he reached the Italian plains, his numbers had dwindled to about 26,000. He was now caught in enemy territory without a supply line or source of reinforcements. And any elephants who had survived to this point were almost certainly traumatized. So what on earth was Hannibal up to? This supposed military genius had just led a starving and weakened army right into enemy territory. Any modern general who lost half their men to mountains would be immediately fired and possibly even depensed on live TV. Here's the thing. While Hannibal may not have planned on losing quite so many men, he had almost certainly expected considerable losses, and he always had a plan for how to replace them. Need men? Northern Italy was full of men. Big, burly Celtic men. All the men Hannibal would ever need to beat off Rome. These Celts were filled with resentment, having only recently been conquered by Rome. <laughs> Hannibal hoped to be seen as a liberator, convince the Celts to cut ties with Rome, and instead join him in crushing Rome. That way. From what we've seen in this episode, Hannibal is not only a strategic genius, but it's also a fine diplomat and negotiator. When he crossed goals, he negotiated a lot and established good relationships with the local tribes. And in fact, I imagine that having already got his army to agree to go through hell without refusals, I think that it indicates that Hannibal must have some kind of skills in convincing people to do stuff. He could gain a source of reinforcements and supplies right in Rome's backyard. But sir, in order to win the loyalty of the Celts, we would need to make a seriously favorable impression on them. How do we get him to like us? Hmm. Kill them. One of Hannibal's first actions in Italy was to obliterate a nearby tribe who wouldn't join him. This sent a clear message to all the other tribes. It was his wrath they should fear. Okay, it's also a kind of negotiation. Not Rome's. The realization that a Carthaginian army had just invaded them must have been shocking for the Romans. <laughs> but when they looked at this ragtag group broken by the Alps, they couldn't have felt very intimidated. However, Hannibal was now in Italy, and he was about to embark on one of the most astonishing military campaigns in all of human history. The Romans may not have known it yet, but there was now a monster loose in their territory, and he was vying for Roman blood. 
the wolf is in the barn. So it was excellent. Honestly, they are doing a tremendous job. Okay, thank you for watching. I will very quickly follow up with part two. Don't hesitate to let me know in the comments what you thought about it. And see you very soon. Bye.